Let us now turn to the word. Acts 20. 22 to 24. In Romans 1, 14. To 17. God is the Lord of grace. God is the Lord of grace. God is the Lord of grace. He's the Lord of grace because grace comes from him. And he gives grace to those whom he gives grace, meaning whom he chooses to give grace. Exodus 33, 19, to say, 19 says, he will be gracious to whom he will be gracious. I will have mercy on whom I, I will have mercy. So that means for us, whomever he considers as worthy, I'm paraphrasing it for us, whomever he considers to be worthy of his grace, worthy of his mercy, he will give, he will show. So it's all according to his desire and his definition. It's not about what I think I deserve, but it is about what God sees as deserving. So even if in, according to human definition, worldly definition, one may not look worthy, appear to be living a worthy life, it doesn't matter. It's all according to God. Sometimes it may f agree with how I understand it. Sometimes it won't. It doesn't matter what I think and what I define as worthy. It is all according to his way because he is the Lord of grace and he is God. So having faith in him means to receive that grace that he has prepared, that he prepared from the beginning and receiving his grace. That means you know his grace is what kind of grace? Amazing grace. Just like the song, amazing grace. Amazing grace that saved the wretch like me. Amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. So receiving his grace means to be moved by his grace and can praise and can, can, can give thanks for that grace because it is amazing grace. There's no other gift like that. No one can do such things. Just like the songs we've been singing here today. So who can separate us from this amazing love, amazing grace that was poured out for me? Un, such an undeserving sinner like me. So to be moved by his grace and being moved by his grace, we have to live each and every day, therefore, paying back for what he has done. Paying back. So paying back because he paid. Because he paid, I need to pay back. So having faith means having this special conscience, right? Conscience meaning you know what was given to you and you did not deserve it. Therefore, in your gratitude, you have to think of ways to pay back because you're in debt now. So debtor, as a debtor, your debt has been paid for. So now I owe him my life. And the way we pay back, because there's no way to pay back in dollars and cents, we pay back by testifying the gospel of his grace, by preaching, by sharing this great news, the good news of the forgiveness of sin, the good news of our salvation. Romans 1.14, where we just read, Paul wrote, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to uh, non-Greeks, but in uh, the original text, a closer translation would be to barbarians, so to Greeks and to barbarians. So whether one is civilized or not, educated or not, one is noble or ignoble, it doesn't matter. Whoever it, it is, whoever is in my way, whoever comes my way, whoever is around me, I ought to um, share this gospel because I need to pay back, um, to the, both to the wise and to the foolish. And, and Paul, these are all words of Paul, the letters are Paul, the, the, what we read in the book of Romans and book of Acts and verse 24 there. He said that if only I may finish my course and the ministry or the task, the task, finish the task that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the gospel of the grace of God. So the ministry there, uh, we read in, in the NIV says um, the task, but in ESV and uh, New King James Version, it says the ministry. So it's the same idea. The ministry that has been given is the task that has been given by someone who is greater. So once we understand that testifying the gospel is the ministry that we received, right? So ministry. Oh, does that mean that I have to become a minister or pastor to preach the gospel? Um, Minister is, uh, or minister, uh, minis a ministry is not just in the context of the Christian um, life, but also uh, in government, 
right, ministers. Uh, in certain European parliamentary uh, governments, um, you have ministers, ministries of education. So instead of department, like in the U.S., you call them the secretary of state, uh, the secretary of the department of whatever. Uh, but in other settings, they call them minister, ministries. So it's to serve. It's to serve because now they have been appointed. So it's through appointment that one is given these responsibilities. And once they're appointed, they take it as the greatest honor to do that work. Right, so in the U.S. setting, it's called cabinet members, right? So this is sort of the privilege that the executive uh, branch has, meaning the president of the United States has, uh, that certainly he or she is elect he's, he's been elected as the president, but he has the, the right to appoint those who will serve the nation with him along his side. So they're called the cabinet members, and they, he, uh, they need to go through hearings to get confirmation, but it's his executive right, privilege, to appoint. And those who are appointed, then they let go of everything that they were doing, and then they come, they pack their bags and come to Washington, D.C., and then they serve, right? So they serve, and they do what the president appointed them to do, whether it's in the area of education, or agriculture, or defense, or whatever it is, they do it as the greatest honor. And that all, of course, is because of who has uh, selected them. So um, who appointed one to do what is uh, what's significant about this task, about this ministry. If someone has um, appointed you to go rob and kill, then you are not only a thief, but your boss is also a thief. And that's not a noble uh, work. That is not an admirable uh, position. But if the appointer, uh, appoint, the appointment came uh, uh, from the king, the king uh, who sits on the throne, then you consider it as your life. Even if it means to let go of everything that you knew as the most precious, most valuable thing, you put all your life into, pour your life out into fulfilling that call, right? That appointment. So one sense of duty, one wants to have a sense of duty, and it has to be the greatest sense of duty, uh, and even to the point of risking uh, one's life. So in the military setting, they would have, um, of course, the Navy SEALs, you guys know about how, how so highly selected they are and how risky it is for them to uh, be trained. Even in training, a lot of people apparently die because it's so rigorous, the training itself, and there's controversy around that. Um, but... They are the group of highly trained, highly selected and highly trained, highly intelligent, how physically uh, um, strong and able to uh, carry out their duty. So a lot of times it could be like, you know, go going and uh, f releasing someone from their ho uh, hostage situation or any uh, maybe ass assassination even. That's very controversial. But uh, in combat s situation, they couldn't be appointed to do that. And they consider it as their life. And there's... Um, uh, there, uh, there is that unspoken and spoken um, message of allegiance and f faithfulness to death because of this highest call uh, that they have received. Uh, even if they may not be called to be part of the Navy SEAL, a Navy SEAL team, uh, in the military there are um, task forces, right? So they are special operation um, teams. So they organize team of um, uh, special and those able um members to make up the team for that task uh, at hand. When we started our MMC uh, in 2014, when we opened up and then we um, got the space and we wanted to really be fruitful in reaching out to the souls in that New York City area, basing on that uh, location, 18 West 33rd, uh, New York City, uh, we formed a task uh, uh, force team, yes. So uh, we met weeks and weeks and weeks, and we discussed, and we drew maps, and we did this and this and that. We brought people in and out, and uh, all, uh, all, met, all hands on deck, really. We put every effort to go out and uh, evangelize, put all our focus and passion on uh, the Manhattan evangelism. We recruit those most able, uh, most fruitful evangelists in our church, um, and, and then have them all put their effort into growing the MMC. So I remember the first year, especially the first six months, it was just like always checking who's coming, how many's coming. Some days would be like 15, other days would be like 40. And it was just um, every, I, I felt like those months went by so fast and I felt like my stomach was in my throat because every like whole week I was anxious and waiting and getting there and who's coming and how to grab them. And we were outnumbered by these like 
uh, visitors, basically, because our team members were, we couldn't bring the whole church there, there's not enough space, but there are members there on task force, team members, and then the outsiders coming, and they were the double, the triple the size than us, and which was very exciting time, but also very anxious, all of it together to be where we are today. Hallelujah! So that, that uh, appointment uh, was a great honor, and that we considered it as the greatest one. So we pray for it. We put every effort into it, um, and we are now seeing the fruit of that uh, result So uh, for that work. So knowing um, that the call itself is grace, that I didn't deserve it, but God called me, um, brings on greater sense of duty, responsibility for the one who is appointed. If they feel like they deserve it and they feel like, well, you know what, I have nothing else happening, nothing else going for me, so I guess I will spend my time here for now. But if someone else calls me from outside and says, hey, come over here and work for me there, then I'll go, then they do not have a great sense of duty uh, for the task at hand. So one must consider the call itself, giving them, being given that ministry itself as grace to be able to do it until the end, as Paul considered. The Apostle Paul considered the ministry of preaching, the, tes- um, the, the effort of testifying the gospel of his grace as the greatest, glor- greatest honor for him. He was able to do it to death. So this notion of um, being appointed is the uh, same as being given freely, and that's obviously the word for grace, meaning for grace. The word grace in Greek is hey karis, and it is uh, it means to be freely given. So like a gift, a gift is freely given. If you paid a price for a gift, someone gives you a birthday gift, and then you say, how much was it? And then you reimburse them, that's not a gift. Someone actually, <laughs> right? It's a merchandise. Um, <laughs> but if someone um, gives you a gift, um, and you didn't earn it, you didn't pay for it, as a receiver, you take it, graciously. You receive it gratefully and graciously. But in case you don't like it, you can take the gift receipt and exchange it. Um, But you're still keeping it. You're not giving it back to them. Um, When we are grateful for the gifts that we receive, then we um, say thank you um, because the giver has given me what he or she thought uh, was appropriate for me and thought of me. So the giver decides what? The giver decides to whom? That's the giver's uh, right, if you will. And the receiver, therefore, ought to know what he is receiving, what she's receiving, how worthy it is, how precious it is, and who has given it to him. So this who and what is very, very important in giving and receiving. So if we understand the... uh, understand God as the Lord of grace, we have to understand what he has given so that our confession of saying, what a wretch, wretched man I am. What a wretch like me. For a wretch like me, he showed his amazing grace. What a wretch. A, a wretch like me. A sinful man. Uh, a, a man who ought, deserves nothing but curse and condemnation in hell forever. He has shown his grace. And that's why I moved. And that's why I am moving now for him. And it's not just a figure of speech, but that one actually lives that life. That's when one understands who the giver is, what he has given, and the receiver receives as exactly as how he has given, what he has given, uh, by whom. So why is this grace all important? Because God planned to be the Lord of grace to not just um, the physical creatures in the material world, but to the spiritual beings that we are. It's like God made man from the dust of the ground, made him a physical being, material being. But he also ma- made man to be a living being by breathing into him breath of life. Let's go to Genesis 2-7. The breath of life and the man became a living being. How did the man become a living being? Where did the breath of life come from? All right, so God is breathing. Who is God? Is he physical? He is material? Did he breathe out carbon dioxide? That's us. We breathe out lovely breath, morning breaths, and we go, oh, no thanks, right? But when God breathes out, breathes into, this is spirit. Because he is spirit, he breathed spirit into the dust body. And the dust being now is spiritual being also. So a dual being is called a living being. He is the ancestor of all mankind. So not only did we 
inherit the physical makeup, the DNAs, uh, if you will, from our ancestors, uh, all the way dating back to Adam. But from Adam, what we receive is the spirit. So we have all become living being. We have all received the spirit of Adam, simply Adam. So we call ourselves Adam. Can we say, I am Adam? Adam. You're Adam to your neighbor, yeah? And our ancestor now, speaking of our ancestor Adam, where he lived was in the Garden of Eden. And the Garden of Eden was where he could eat whatever he wanted because his job was not to work the ground, but he was to take care of the garden. So everything was given to him freely. Was he grateful for that? Not sure. Maybe not. Because it was such a paradisal environment uh, that he took it probably as, uh, he took it grant for granted because uh, when a serpent, a snake comes to the woman who comes from the man, Eve, uh, the woman, she listened to his word, uh, the, the snake's word, which twisted the word of God. In Genesis 2.17, before the snake comes to the woman, God speaks to the man and says, you can eat from any of the trees in the garden except from this one tree called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because if you eat of it, you will surely die, God said. You will surely die. Now, when God is speaking to men, he's not speaking to the physical body. He's speaking to the spirit, the living being. The living being came from God. If you want to live with God, live through God and receive his life, continuously stay alive in the spirit, you need to live by the word of God. So the way to live uh, by the word of God was by obeying and not eating that fruit. It was nothing about the fruit itself. However, the snake used, the serpent uses those words and twists them and said, you know what? You will not surely die, he said to the woman. And, uh, and he went on and said, in instead, if you take the fruit, you will be like God. You will open your eyes and know the things of God. You see how God gave you all these things because he has everything? Now you don't have to depend on him and feel like, oh, thank you, or feel a little guilty even about it. You can actually have all of it because you will be like God. So those words were sweet to the ears of the woman, and she took the fruit and gave to the man. So Adam then broke the word of God by taking the fruit from that tree that was forbidden. So that at that moment, uh, that moment is called sin, the original sin uh, for man. So the first sin was committed. That's a spiritual sin that's, that broke the word of God, disobeyed the command of God. And that sin, the result of that sin was that he was, Adam and Eve, they were cut off from God. They were cast out, driven out from the garden. And the garden was shut out or shut in. It was closed off by putting a flaming of sword. God kept them uh, out so that no man can return to the Garden of Eden ever. But that's just to materialize the spiritual reality, which is that all men then receive the result of sin in their spirits. Uh, Romans 6, 23 says, the wage of sin is death. So that's, that the spirit, when the spirit sinned, the spirit died. And spiritual death is not physical death, even though you don't feel it physically. The spirit is cut off from God. So at the moment, not only cut off from God, but now the, the spirit that once belonged to God belongs to the one that the spirit listened to, and that's the devil. So all men became slaves of the devil to follow him to where the devil is going. So where, who is the devil? The devil is the origin of sin, not the original sin, but the origin of sin. Isaiah 14, 12 on describes that, that he is an angel who sinned against God in the spiritual heaven before man was made. And because of that, God cast him out of the spiritual heaven. You see the parallels, right? The garden kick, being kicked out. But before that garden event was the spiritual heaven event where the angel rebelled against God. So he becomes a fallen angel. He's called Satan at that point. Satan is the devil who later on comes in the form of the serpent to tempt the man the same way, to be like God. So to pr prepare for the devil and his angels are, uh, is the eternal la uh, lake of fire, eternal fire, as Matthew 25, 41 says. And all men became uh, slaves of the devil because in Adam, all men listened to basically listened to the devil and sinned. However, before kicking out, uh, 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 driving out Adam, God clothed Adam and Eve in special garments. What did God give them? Garments of skin. Well, did they have garments on any time before? They were naked, but nothing was wrong with them until they ate the fruit. They realized that they were naked. They felt the shame and fear as a result of sin. So they made clothing for themselves out of fig leaves. But God took them off, and God gave them special clothing from God. Also, wait a minute. So we don't 
have to be vegetarians or vegan uh, wearing people. We should get the leather, the fur coat. Yes, God likes that. Is that what it means? What, that, what the clothing represents, what the garment represents is God's giving. Right? What we see is that man's effort to protect himself, man's effort to save himself there, and God takes it off and says, no, it's going to be coming from me. So by giving them the garments of skin, we see the foreshadow of what God would do later on. That's his giving, his gift to all men. For them to be ready, however, God worked in stages in the history of the Bible, we see, to show himself as the Lord of grace, to show grace, be gracious to men, by calling on a people, one people coming from a man named Abraham, the children of Abraham, later known as the people of Israel. Before they become a people or nation of Israel, they were slaves in Egypt under the Pharaoh. Do you see another parallel, right? All men became spiritually slaves under the devil. But physically, when God begins to work to reveal himself closely, uh, more clearly, he's calling on a people in, from their physical slavery, social situation, which is in Egypt. God sends Moses and the people are delivered from their slavery and into the desert they were led with the promise they will enter the land of Canaan. In the desert, they were given the law. The law is also called the law of Moses. More than the Ten Commandments, there were hundreds, hundreds, all totaling 613 points to the law. The law basically says in Exodus 21, 23, 25, it sort of summarizes very nicely, which is that, if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, for wound, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. So if your neighbor gout, <laughs> pokes your eye out, then, then under the law, you, put, you pin your neighbor against the door or against the wall and, okay, say cheese, here we go. And then take the eye out. Now I got everyone's attention. They knock your tooth out. Then what do you say? Which tooth is it? One, two. The molar number one, molar two. Okay. Open. Ah. And then you. <laughs> and then break it. You, your neighbor burns you by accident or not by accident. Then you say, stay right there. Let me throw you some hot water. So that was the law, basically. In terms of personal injuries or property uh, damage or loss, it was the notion of, uh, it was based on the principle of, retribution. What kind of principle? So like you get what you deserve. So even in Exodus 22, 1, it says, if a man steals an ox or a sheep or kills it or sells it, he shall repay five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. So there is, um, uh, there, there are special regulations and guidelines how to repay under the law of Moses. So this is why today, so the modern, uh, even the modern laws around the world, especially the European, uh, Western, uh, the Western world and advanced societies, including Western and uh, Eastern uh, societies, they trace back to the law of Moses, the Mosaic law, which is about 1,500 years prior to coming of Jesus. So that's about 25, 2,700 years uh, ago. That's very impressive because God gave them this law. So this law can be called the law of retribution. What kind of law again? Let's look at Ezekiel 18.20, however, and see what happens to sinner. The soul who sins is the one who will die. The son will not share the guilt of the father, nor will the father share the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous man will be credited to him, and the wickedness of the wicked will be charged against him. So under this law of retribution, you pay an eye for eye, tooth for tooth, life for life. There is no way to replace the guilt of the guilty. No one, no other man can pay for your guilt, in other words. So a son commits sin and the father understands that now the son has to die as a result of his murder. Let's say he murders someone and then now he has to go life for life. He has to die. The father who's so loving and so kind and says, I cannot let, watch my son die. Let me die in place of him. What does the law say? No, you cannot. Because the soul that commits, the man who commits sin will die. Okay, so under the law of retribution, the one who is guilty must die. No replacement is accepted. Through the law, one will realize then that one is a sinner. The, the law that is made up of do, do's and don'ts, and mostly don'ts, 
uh, all 613 points of them in the time of the Old Testament. So once the law comes through Moses to the people of Israel, their lives become very difficult because every day they're guided by these do's and don'ts. And when they broke the law, they would feel not only guilty, but by witnesses, they would be convicted as guilty. So depending on what they committed, they could be, uh, again, tooth for tooth, burn for burn, and then pay back, or they could be killed. So they feared for the consequence of their sin, thanks to the law. So they understood that they were sinners without hope, deserving curse, if not death. However, flip side of the law, the same law, the law of retribution, is also called the, uh, uh, the law or law of redemption, a law of atonement. So the same law, having many, many uh, regulations uh, within them, like many, many commandments, uh, on the one hand is the strict uh, retribution rules, but on the other hand, there is the law of atonement, redemption. Atonement means atoning, redeeming, is paying the price of sin. So on the one hand, it says, a man cannot. A man who sins must die for his own sin. No one else can pay for his sin. No man can pay for his sin. However, under the law, this law of re, uh, redemption or atonement, because they're the same concept, atonement re, redemption, under that law, an animal can die in place of the sinner. So it's very interesting when you look at um, the, the law and the Bible. There's sort of like these contradictions, but they're within the same uh, attribute of God, for God to show his mercy and his grace, these seemingly op oppositional, contradictory parts are there. So on the one hand, no man can be replaced by another, uh, uh, by another. But on the other hand, animals can die. So when do we see for the first time animals dying for men in the Old Testament, which is the very first event? Quickly. The Passover lamb, Exodus 12, uh, describes uh, the very first, uh, very last night before the people of Israel are delivered, right? They're let go of. The exodus of Israel out of Egypt happens because of this night called the Passover. So Passover, the word Passover means God will pass over. The spirit of death will pass over and not strike that household with death if it had blood. The blood of lamb. Right, the blood of sacrifice. So when that blood was given or put on the door frame, the firstborn of that household will be protected, will be spared. Because God said, unless there's blood, every firstborn, human and livestock, would be struck dead. So what God was looking for was not the firstborn, but the blood. Yes, so the blood. But if there was blood, God passed over. If there was no blood, he struck them. Death. So there, from there on, they are to commemorate the Passover to this day. Jews celebrate, uh, the Jewish people celebrate the Passover. That's the origin. Uh, but with that, there is this thing called atoning sacrifice or the sin offering, as Leviticus uh, 4, 3 to 4 describes. If it is anointed um, priest who sins, thus bringing guilt on the people, then he shall offer for the sin that he has committed a bull from the herd without blemish to the Lord for a sin offering. He shall bring the bull to the entrance of the tent of meeting before the Lord and lay his hand on the head of the bull and kill the bull before the Lord. So the animals, usually a bull, a goat, or a sheep. So these are in the same family. And they, the key was that they had to be ble without blemish. They had to be perfect. No, no lame, um, not like, oh, this part is so lame. I mean, like lame as in like no, not able to walk or has this disease or like patches of hair loss or one eye missing. Not like that. It has to be a perfect, pure, one-year-old given in place of who? The sinner. That was called the sin offering. What kind of offering? Sin offering. Where was this done? At the tent of meeting. In other words, the tabernacle. In other words, the sanctuary. First, it was in the form of the tabernacle in the desert, but later on when the people of Israel settled in Jerusalem, uh, the land that's known as Israel today, the temple was built through the King Solomon. So the sanctuary was the meeting place with God and uh, Israel, God and men, and it was where the sin offering was given. Now the sin offering was the animal was killed, the blood was drained, and it was uh, at the altar of the burnt offering at the, near the entrance of the court, or in the courtyard. But after they, they, the priest passed through that, they would go into the... The, actually the tabernacle structure, the first curtain would bring them into the holy place. And the holy place, there are these objects, but after that, the high priest would enter through the curtain, the veil, and enter the inner room, the most inner room called the most holy place. What's it called? What was inside the most holy place? 
the ark. Yes, the ark was inside the most holy place. What was inside the ark? There are a couple other objects in there, but what's the object that we want to talk about? Because we talked about the law, the stone tablets that Moses brought down from the mount were inside the ark. Now, if that was the only thing going for the people of Israel, God would only be the God demanding the price of sin from sinners. Yes? If God were to be represented through the law only, all men must die and pay the price of sin in hell. But what is gracious about God is that even in the tabernacle, there is a representation of who he is. That on top of the ark that housed the stone tablets was a panel of wood. And that was called the atonement cover. Atonement cover. This is where your sins are atoned. Also called the mercy seat. So when the high priest brings the, the blood from the altar into the holy place where they sprinkle, and that blood was carried into the most holy place, it arrived onto the top of the atonement cover. So the ark was like a box of wood, had a top on, and the top is called the atonement cover because it's the cover that represents that God will atone the sins of Israel by that blood. Do you understand? Amen? Because why is it amen for us? Because again, that's a shadow of his grace to come. And from there, the mercy seed, he would be gracious to the people who have brought the sin offering, the blood, to be forgiven of their sins. On the other hand, there was a prophecy. Let's go to Isaiah 53, 4 to 7. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Isaiah prophesied of this one to come, who will be led away like a sheep. What kind of sheep are we thinking of? The atoning sacrifice, the sin offering. Do you understand? Right? So again, to the Gentiles like you and me and our ancestors, this would have no meaning because we don't know about sin offerings. But to the, to the Jews, the people of Israel, they knew what a sin offering looked like, a sheep that is led away silently to die in place of the sinner. And here's prophets saying that he is coming as man to die in place of the sins of the whole world. Not as an animal sacrifice that needs to be repeated year after year and still not having any impact on the spirit sin. Because no matter how many animals you kill year after year, the sin in the spirit cannot be taken away. That is all in keeping until the reformation, until the new order, the true thing to come. And the true thing, the true one who was prophesied to come came. And in front of the temple where they were giving this offering, what did he say? Destroy this temple. And I will raise it again in three days. Who said it? The one who called himself the son of God, Yeshua, Jesus. We say Yeshua, that's his original name in Hebrew, which comes from Matthew 121. He will save his people from their sin. So what was he saying about the temple? The Jews certainly got angry because without the temple, you get no mercy from God. You do not have mercy from God. You do not have forgiveness from him for your sins. But here Yeshua is saying about the temple of his body, you will put me to death. I will be killed by the hands of men, but in three days I'll be raised back to life. Through the death and the resurrection of my body, I will become the atoning sacrifice that is perfect, that is eternal. This is why John the Baptist said, that here is the Lamb of God. He is the Lamb of God because he is the Son of God who was prophesied to come, and he came, and the way he was going to die was by shedding his blood. Go to 1 Peter 1, 18 to 19. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. So the, the lamb without blemish or defect, again, understanding the Old Testament law, we understand the importance of finding that perfect lamb to die in place of a man sinner. The animal lamb, 
man sinner. But here is Christ who came to become the Lamb of God. As the Lamb of God, he would die, and he is the one without blemish or defect. So how is he different from the animals, and how is he different from the rest of us? Man cannot die for another, right? So even if Yeshua died, if you see him as man, his death is meaningless. It doesn't mean anything. He doesn't take care of my sins. He doesn't take care of our sins. Even if his life may be worthier than an animal's life. So what is his blood? What is his flesh? Why is it precious, his blood? Go to John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. So the Word was with God in the beginning. The Word was God. So that Word is spirit. The Word is God. Do you understand? So that Word then, in verse 14, became what? Flesh. And dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The one and only there is referring to the only Son, the only begotten Son who came from the Father. So here is the Son of God, even though he came fully human, born a baby, just like us. He looked like us. He felt like us. He experienced the body like us. However, the material, if you will, the ingredient, if you will, of his Flesh is not like ours. What is the ingredient of our flesh? Certainly you can use the periodic table and use all the elements there, potassium, calcium, whatever minerals you can name, and uh, you know all the materials that come from the, the, the ground. Basically what it is is dust. Because how do you know when someone dies and is buried? It perishes. The body perishes, disappears basically. It turns into dust. But the, because we come from dust, God made the body from dust. Animals, us, we all come from dust. But there is one man that ever lived and died on earth who's not of dust. His body is not made of dust. His body is what? Is what? What is the ingredient of his body? Is the word. It is spirit. And therefore, everything about his body is the word and spirit. That is his blood. So why is his blood precious without blemish or defect? Because it is spirit. It is without sin. So that's why he was going to become the perfect lamb of God who would die in place of man and shed his precious blood to cleanse the sins of the world, of all men, so that they would be... Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15, 45. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last, Adam, a life-giving spirit. So pause there. The first man, who is the man who came first in history? Adam. He is called the first Adam. Adam there is referring to the human race, all mankind. Do you understand? All right? All men in Adam is the living being, living spirit. So this is the first man, the first Adam. But then there is the last Adam, only two, first and the last. The last Adam is not a living being, a living spirit, but he is a life-giving spirit. Because now there's a relationship already implied there. One is living, has a function to live, but then the other is the one who gives that life for that function to work. You see the two different, and then they are, have a relationship. So the last Adam is Adam, his spirit, but he becomes man, but he is now the source of life who gives life to the first Adam. Do you understand? Who's the last Adam then? Keep reading. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural and after the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man from heaven. Who is the second man? Who is the last Adam? That is the son of God, Yeshua, who came to become the lamb of God. Hallelujah. So the word became flesh. The word became blood. So the, what the law had been instilling in the people for thousands of years, that no man can replace another for his sin to die, while the animals, countless animals, think about how many animals died every year for every sinner in Israel, for thousands of years. Even so, however, no animal's blood can take away the sin of men. It, will be, it was done for this moment when he, Yeshua, the Son of God, the sinless God, would go to the cross and die like a sacrifice like a man, like, like a lamb, the lamb of God, and say, it is finished. When he died, he said, it is finished because it was the moment that he was laying down his life according to the Father's command that he received in the beginning, the purpose of his coming, which was coming in the flesh, which was for him to die. And only through his death, he himself 
can say, thank you, Father, for your grace. Wait a minute. What do you mean about that? I thought he came to die in my place and our place. That too. But beyond that reason, more important, greater than, grander than that reason is for the Father. In Jonah, chapter 2, 8 to 9, there is prophecy. Remember Jonah, the one who was swallowed by the big fish. And he prays there, but actually his prayer is a prophecy of the Son of God. So in verse, uh, in chapter 8, uh, chapter 2, 9 says, But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. What I have vowed I will pay. I will give. I will repay for what you have done for me. Salvation belongs to the Lord. With the voice of thanksgiving, in the belly of a fish, Jonah had said this. The belly of fish is the same word for sheol. Sheol in Hebrew is the same concept as ho hades, hades, the universe, the place of death, the depths of the pit. Where did the Son of God come? To the depths of the pit, to hades, to the place of death. The moment he died, humbled himself, as Philippians chapter 2, 6 on says, humbled himself to the point of a, a dying on a cross. That moment was the lowest point that the Son of God would become to be lowered, the lowest. And at that moment, instead of complaining and resenting, go, Father, I don't have sin. Why do I have to suffer and die like this and become sin? This thing that I hate the most, why do I have to become that? Instead of complaining, he gave thanks to the Father. Why? Because the father prepared the greatest gift for the son in the beginning. Hebrews 1, 2 says, before the creation of the world, God appointed him to be the heir of all things. The father appointed the son to be the heir, the heir to receive the inheritance of all things on earth, under the earth, of in heaven, on earth. All of it were prepared for the son. And the son, when he was dying, even though he lost everything, Everything. He laid down everything. He knew that at that moment of the cross was the moment that he will now receive that grace prepared for him from the beginning and already sent thanksgiving ahead to the Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father, for your grace. There's no one like you. There's no one like you, no other grace, no other gift than yours. The Son gave thanks to the Father and at that moment, with that thankful heart, he condemned the unthankful one. Who was the unthankful creature? It was the devil. Even though he was decorated with talents and beauty to worship God and glorify God in the spiritual heaven, because of those things, he became proud instead and used that to want to make himself God. And God saw that as evil as sin, the sin and drove him out from the spiritual heaven to this moment of judgment. Hallelujah! And by shedding his precious blood, the, the blood that is spirit, the blameless, without defect, that is eternal, that is perfect, not like the blood of animals, not like the blood of any sinners, but that is the blood of God, the incarnate God, shed to redeem to redeem the pay, to pay the price of sin on behalf of, instead of, all men. Hallelujah. That is called the redemption. Do you understand? His blood is called the redeeming blood. What kind of blood? Ephesians 1, 7 says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins, our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. So in his blood, we have redemption. And by faith, we have been forgiven by believing in his redemption that when i believe that he died in place of me even though he knows no sin he became sin on our behalf on my behalf i am welcoming his blood that paid the price that cleansed my sin so that i don't have to go to hell the price of sin amen that's what grace is he prepared for that for all men. Whether they knew it or not, whether they want it or not, whether they deserve it or not, God prepared that for all men to come to him by their faith one by one to be forgiven. But that redemptive work was done for once at the cross 2,000 years ago, and he died. But did he stay dead? He said he was going to die, but he said he was also going to be raised back to life. Just as he said, in three days, the father raised him back to life. Yeshua resurrected. Do you believe that he resurrected? When he resurrected, he still had scars on his body that a disciple actually had to touch to be confirmed that it was the Lord. 
after his resurrection, he ascended to heaven in the midst of the uh, witnesses. He sat down on the throne in heaven. And on the throne, he is seen as the Lamb of God, as the apostle, as John, also called the Apostle John, later on, in, in, as he wrote the book of Revelation, he said, I saw a lamb, someone who looked like a lamb who was slain. A lamb is a baby animal who died young. So this is the vision of John saying, I see a lamb who died young, meaning who died undeserving death. And I see that he died because he has scars. This is the vision that John had of heaven. And that is the spiritual heaven where we want to go as the children of God, as believers of Yeshua. Who is there on the throne? It is the Lamb of God. So why is it that he, when he was glorified, when he was resurrected, some people didn't recognize him because he was different. Something about it was indifferent. He was glorified. So he who made all things, he can make all things, design all things, remake everything. Why didn't he patch up his holes? Why didn't he do a remake, you know, makeover? Makeover to look even more beautiful without scars. I mean, think about what we do to hide our scars and blemishes on our face and our bodies. Why didn't he do that for himself? Because forever he will bear the mark of his suffering and his death, his suffering, his death, to be praised forever and ever for his grace. Amen? The throne that he took is referred to as the throne of grace, as Hebrews 4, 16 says. The throne of grace. Why is that the throne of grace? Because it is the throne that the Father prepared for the Son before the creation in the beginning. The father says, son, here is the throne I prepared for you in the spiritual heaven. Yes, God wants to take us to spiritual heaven, but it was prepared for the son. It was for the son that if there was glory, there were angels. For the son, the throne was there, the name was there. For the son to take it all in all glory, being exalted in the highest place, receiving the name that is above all names, the name of God, the name Yeshua, taking the throne. Now he has received the grace from the Father by being seated on the throne and reigning forever and ever. He is testifying, Father, you alone are the Lord of grace. Amen? But the Son himself is now also the Lord of grace. He is the Lord of grace, the God of grace, because it's from that throne of grace, the throne of mercy. He is being gracious to whom he is gracious. For his grace to be given graciously to those whom he wants. The spirit of grace was sent in his name. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not force himself into non-believers. The non unbelieving, non-believing world. The rebellious, the refusing and uh, stubborn, evil world. The Holy Spirit enters only those who have been washed by the blood of Yeshua who have humbly welcomed the blood of Jesus. Who can receive? Who would receive his blood humbly and with welcoming heart? He who confesses that he is a wretch. He who con confesses that a wretch, not just like feeling, I feel so guilty because I did something I shouldn't have done. Not these people. We have so many of these people in this room. That's why you come and go. Sometimes you show up out of your guilt and you do your Jesus thing and then you go back and do your worldly thing. That's not what this hour should be about. The guilty one, the confessing one, should fear the fire of hell because that's where sinners go. So when you say you're guilty and I'm confessing my sin, you ought to see the fire of hell in front of your eyes. That's what you, should drive you to repent and that your repentance drives into meeting the Lord your Savior, the Redeemer, Yeshua, and that your life is never the same as a result. But because your repentance is like this penitence that you do in a little booth, I'm sorry, Father, I've sinned. Can you please like forgive me so that I don't get hit by a car tomorrow? That I don't get fired this week? God is irrelevant for those people. So examine yourselves right now. Do you know the grace of God? Has he shown his grace to you? That's the question. Has he shown his grace to me? then I would know his grace. And if I know his grace, I would know how amazing this grace is. For I know that I'm an undeserving sinner, a wretch, 
deserving nothing, nothing of God, but everything of hell. I deserve everything that the devil deserves because I'm sin. I'm full of evil. Everything that I breathe in and out is evil. I deserve nothing but the fire of hell. When one has that true confession and realize the reality of hell, then when they meet Jesus, Yeshua as the Savior, as the personal Savior, their own Savior, their Redeemer, then by that grace they are moved. So the change is like a blind opening his eye. How can the blind man live the same life, guys? His life will never be the same. You could not see one minute, but when you meet Jesus, now you see. That is night and day. As one preacher has said so well, you're crossing a street one day, a sunny day, and you're all healthy, and you're crossing the street, and out of nowhere, an 18-wheeler, whatever, the truck, trailer truck comes by and hits you. What happens to you? You're either paralyzed or you're dead. But the man just gets up, dusts himself off, and goes home. Mama asks, how was your day? Fine. Anything new? Nah. I just got hit by a truck, but, you know, nothing happened. Is this somebody who was hit by a truck? The grace of God should come to us like getting hit by a truck that I died, but by the grace of God that I've been raised back to life then how can that man live the same life? But so many so-called Christians and even people in this room live like that. You get hit by a truck, and then you turn around, you live the same life. Some days you don't feel good, you show up to church and you cry. And some days you don't because you got other things to take care of. Some days you like you didn't do well in school, you didn't do you didn't feel good at job and you yelled at your boss, you felt guilty, you show up and you pray. So forgive me, sorry Jesus, and then you don't show up. You were never never given that grace. You were what we have to understand about the Lord of grace, understanding God's center view as we teach in logos, the theistic view of the Bible and of the world and of life. God doesn't give grace because I need it. He gives grace because he wants to. Do you understand? And to whom he wants to. It's not because he feels sorry for me because I deserve it or I beg, like I pray 100 days or I fasted for three days or 30 days. No. And his grace has been given to us at the cross 2,000 years ago through his redemption. The atonement has come and has been fulfilled through the shedding of the blood of the lamb, the lamb of God. The precious blood was already shed once for all. However, for that Grace to be grace. God has to see you and consider you to be gracious too. This is the difference. Why you can show up day after day, week after week, your faith is still a toddler faith or infant faith or ghost faith or fake faith. If God sees and considers me to be gracious to, I would be growing in my faith because I would know his grace. The spirit of grace lets us know what we have received. That is the gift of God, the grace of God. For the giver is the God who is the great God, the king of kings, the maker of heavens and the earth. The one, the only holy one without sin. And what he has given is holy, precious blood. More precious than silver or gold. More precious than anything in the world. Given to a wretch like me. Not given to those who are living a clean life in the mountains meditating. Not given to the A students or goody goody two shoes who doesn't break rules, doesn't even say anything bad or sees anything, anything bad, hears anything bad. Somebody was very clean. No. Because then they would say, I deserved it. Because I've done everything right. I deserve his grace. For his grace to be gracious, for his grace to be the most important thing, like that truck that ran you over. He gives to those who are confessing wretch. Do you understand who God is now? 
Only when you are repentant like that, I'm a wretch worth less than a dead dog. Do you know where those words come from? Who said those words? I am worth less than a dead dog. One of Saul, King Saul's son, uh, uh, Jonathan, and Jonathan's son, so grandson of the King Saul. Who was Jonathan? Jonathan was a brother, right? Sort of adopted brother to King David. And they were almost like soulmates. They loved each other very much. And when Saul becomes crazy enough to kill his own son-in-law, David, Jonathan protects him. And when Jonathan is killed by David's men, because now Saul's house becomes an enemy of David's kingdom, when David comes to the throne, he remembers the words of Jonathan. When you come to throne, when you come in power as the king of Israel, remember my Remember me, remember my children, my son. So David makes a point to look for, as makes his, son, his men to look for any surviving members of Jonathan. And they said, there is one man, a son of Jonathan, who is lame. His feet are not working, he's disabled. Because when he was a baby, his nurse dropped him. There's this chaos going on. So he is disabled, and he is now really enemy of state, right? Enemy of the kingdom. But David said, call for him and bring him to me. And David said to him, because I owe my life to your father. Now I want to pay back this grace to you because you're the only one that I can see. The only one that I can pay back is you. So you will eat with me at my table for the rest of your life, rest of my life and rest of your life. So it says his name was Mephibosheth. As a lame man and once the enemy of state, eats with the king's sons and children at the king's table for the rest of his life. Someone who understands it, and, and that's when Mephibosheth says, how can this be for someone who's worth less than a dead dog? Less than than a dead dog. Who wants a dead dog? Nobody. But you have shown your grace to me for the sake of my father. I am so grateful. It is to confess that I'm a wretch before the Lord of grace, understanding that I'm a wretch all the way, every way I look at myself, the things that I've done with my hands, the things that I have Touch the things that I have eaten, drank, and done with my body. The things that I have thought in my mind, in my dreams, and all the evil things that I have consumed. And on top of that, the sin that I inherited from my father, his father, his father, all the way to Adam, looking at all of it. I am worthless than a dead dog. I deserve to die. Not just die in this life, but go to hell. But because of your grace, I am saved. And if I know that, I've been hit by this big truck. My life is now changed through the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of grace who lets me know more and more of how amazing this grace is. That is only by his grace I can stand before God. That the Holy Spirit then compels me. He is constraining me. So there was the earlier translation is constraining. The closer translation is constraining me. Binding, binding me that I can't even breathe. That he is just, just leading me this way to testify the gospel of his grace for the rest of my life. Proverbs 22 verse 7 says, the borrower is the slave of the lender. The borrower is the slave of the lender. Who is the lender who pay the price with his life? It's Yeshua. And because of his lending of his grace, I'm alive. I don't have to go to hell. All I did was just simply believe. I didn't pay a price for it. If I had to, if there was a way to earn my way to heaven, we ought to be trying that. 
But there will be no grace of God if that were the case. If God said, okay, you want to go to heaven? You need to fast for 40 days. Don't want to go to hell? Fast for 40 days. We have to, if that's the rule that he would make. But God will never be the Lord of grace. But he decided in eternity to be the Lord of grace. By showing grace, he wants to receive the praise and glory from those who confess that they are wretch, worth less than a dead dog, so that he is magnified forever and ever as the Lord of grace. So he did not put a price tag on it. And because he's been given to me, he has given this gift to me freely. Now I ought to be bound and constrained by the spirit of grace to open up my mouth. Because if I remain sly and silent, then punishment will take on, come over me. In 2 Kings chapter 7, there's a story of four leprous men during the famine in Israel. And Israel was under siege. Under siege by uh, the enemies. So the whole city is now under siege. They're, they're, like in, they're surrounded by their enemies. The enemy's about to take them. And because it's famine, over level famine, there's no food, there's no way out. It's a matter of time the enemies will break into the wall and then take over the city. Simultaneously, what's happening is that there are four lepers, men living outside the city, because according to the law, leprous people cannot be inside the camp, inside the city, because they're unclean. So they were out there and they're hungry. And then they realize the enemies are camped around them. And they say, you know what? We're going to die anyway, either with, from leprosy or hunger or by these enemies. Why don't we just go and check out what's going on there? Because we smell food and noise over there. Now, when they move their body slowly over to the enemy's camp, what's happening with the enemies is that they're eating and drinking and waiting for just counting the hours till taking over Israel. And suddenly they hear horses and chariots coming their way. And they're thinking, oh, Israel has called for help from Egypt. They have now allies coming at us. We better leave. So they leave everything in their camp and they run back home. Meanwhile, it was just the four leprous hungry men. So when they go there, there's nobody. And everything is left. So they go from tent and they eat put it in their pocket. They go to another tent. They eat. They stuff their pocket, and they're enjoying. They can't believe it. Do you think they had teeth even? They're like <laughs> spilling and all this mess and like patches of missing skin and limb probably, but they're enjoying it because they're alive now. They have food. They have hope. But then they said to each other in verse 9, we are not doing right. This day is a day of good news. If we are silent and wait until the morning light, punishment will overtake us. Now, therefore, come, let us go and tell the king's household. Let's go and share this good news. There's a way for our people to live. There's food here. We need to stop doing it for ourselves and stuffing ourselves and enjoying for ourselves. We need to bring it to the people who are perishing because they do not know. So like that, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of grace, lets us pay back by opening up our mouth because our Lord was silent. He was a silent lamb. He did not open up his mouth to defend. But now I have to open up my mouth, defend. I have to pay back the debt. The debt is that the one who paid the price on my behalf, in my place, no one can go to hell for me. No one can pay the price on my behalf. No one, it's impossible. I cannot die for my child and my child cannot die for me. My mother cannot die for me. No one can die for each other because we're all sinners. Unless it is the son of God without sin. And because he did so, I owe his life. I owe my life to him. So is there a way for me to pay him back? There's not enough silver or gold in the world to pay back. How can you pay back for what he has done? That he saved me from hell, from the price of sin, so I don't have to, to be tormented and punished and, and be tortured forever and ever in that most horrific, painful place called hell. He's rescued me by paying the price of sin, an undeserving sinner like me, worth less than a dead dog, just by simply believing and welcoming that grace and say, amen, I believe you. I thank you for it. I receive it. Just by simply believing, I have now been cleansed, been forgiven of my sin, now being moved from death to life how can I pay back for that that's why now I turn to the souls around me he has left back the souls in the world to pay them pay him back by seeking them out that's what I ought to be doing as someone who has now been given the ministry to testify the gospel of his grace the one who saw me worth worth his grace, 
call me by grace. And that's the testimony of Paul. Paul on paper is perfect. And he himself said it. I, I was circumcised in day eight, a Pharisee, a Jew by birth, and Roman citizen. He was a scholar in his day, very intelligent and flawless in the eyes of the law. Yet when he heard the voice of the Lord saying, why do you persecute me? He was cut to the heart. And he realized the one that he thought was a cult leader that these crazy people have made up to be the son of God is truly God. If he spoke to him, even though he died, he truly must be alive. And if he's alive from the dead and he's alive forever and ever, then he must be God. So Paul knew that it was by God's grace, his grace alone, he is what he is. That by his grace that he has been called, that even the outwardly, he was not sinful. He was religious and he was flawless, outwardly, inside. The evil that, the, that he does not want to do, this he keeps on doing. The good that he wants to do, he does not do. That's the confession he made in Romans 7. What a wretched man I am. Who will save me from this body of death? But thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, salvation has come. Hallelujah. And through him, a man, a young man named Timothy was made a disciple and later a partner in the ministry. Timothy. Timothy was a son of a Christian mom. She was a Jew and he, his father was Greek. But the 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 Jewish mother probably was converted through Paul's preaching. She becomes a Christian, and her mother becomes Christian. So Timothy was raised in a very religious setting, and having now mother and grandmother as Christian, he was taught the word of the truth from a young age. He didn't go out and live a wretch, wretched life. He didn't become a drug addict or drug selling or gangster or robber or thief or corrupted. He was not a prostitute, none of that. He inherited the faith from the home and he, he received the teaching from Paul. And he became not only a disciple of Paul, but also a partner with Paul in the ministry of testifying the gospel of his grace. What does that mean for us? Young or old, newcomer or someone who has come from outside and came into Christ, into church, someone who was raised in the church, Whoever you are, whoever we may be, we have no excuse. The grace has been revealed to us by his grace. By his grace, someone spoke to you this message of grace. By his grace, you have been led here today. Amen? It is by his grace. When I thought about this, I was so moved and so broken. By his grace. That I have been raised in the, in the church, even though it was very painful so many years of my life. Being a pastor's daughter and always thinking of, okay, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be a pastor's daughter. I don't want to live with all these people around me and conscious of their eyes and their judging eyes. And, the, and seeing the pains of ministry, I don't, I don't want to be part of that. And then at the same time, I was being educated and in this worldly knowledge that could have easily pulled me away from God. But when it was time, it was time God was calling for me to lay down. And it was the perfect time that I laid down because I was feeling already torn because the knowledge that, that I, was, I pursued and the knowledge that I was teaching in the world is a hum, based in humanism. It's anti-God. And I found myself struggling to teach and speak and word, write these words and read these words that are all humanist and anti-God. Even though it's not saying anti-God, anything that's pursuing the cause and for humanism is that. While I'm Believing in this teaching and theistic teaching and the word of God, I couldn't. It was time for me to let go, surrender. Because what I have been taught is more precious than any, any of the books that I've read, any of the teachings that I received. And I found a great teacher in my mother, my pastor. Her teaching has opened my eyes to the greatest truth and that is about the Lord of grace. And I understand today it is by his grace he called me. When he called my mother, he called me. And he saw me. And when it was time, he called me to now to be fully devoted in the ministry of testifying the gospel of his grace. And I'm all the more moved. Even though this path may be difficult, lonely, challenging. Not because of my problem or my family's problem. It's because of all of you, the souls, the body of Christ. My prayer is all about the the church. My heartache is because of the church. I feel, uh, I feel happy when the souls are doing well, but I feel very pain when the souls are not doing well. When I see concerning souls, I am losing sleep over them. It's because of all the souls. Yet I consider it all as his grace because it is by his grace he called me. By his grace. 
a sinner less than, worth less than a dead dog like me. He has shown his grace. He was gracious to me, has been and is and always will be. So I'm honored to testify this grace, looking forward to that day when the greatest grace will be revealed when the Lord returns. That is our hope, that in that day when the Lord of grace appears, that would be the greatest grace that we can witness and partake. Until then, let us press on, faithfully testifying the gospel of grace, paying back the debt to the souls that have been given to us. Let's pray. You can go out and tell others, non-believers, that God is good. He heard my prayer and gave me a job. God is good. He heard my prayer and he healed me. God is good. I was lonely, but now he has given me friends and family. But that is not the, the message of the gospel. All those things are perhaps the symptoms, side effects, the extras of the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel, the good news of His grace is about Jesus Christ, Yeshua, the Son of God. He who knows no sin became sin, took on my sin on His body, the sin that He hates so much that He became so that we may know His grace, receive His grace and be moved by His grace and give him thanks and pay him back for that grace forever and ever. That is the message of the gospel. The Son of God became sin on your behalf, friend. Just receive him. Receive his blood. And you too will know his grace. Let's raise our hands to heaven to give thanks to him. I owe you my life. I owe you my life because you pay the price for me, Yeshua. Yeshua! Thank you, Father, for showing me the error of my ways, showing me, Father, what a wretch I was. Thank you, Father. Young or old, whether you've done Logos or not, whether you understand everything and know how to say everything well or not, we ought to be doing the work of testifying the gospel of Christ. It may mean for the elders who are not physically able to go out to the street to support fully in prayer, in service of helping out with babysitting, food service, whatever it may be. The young, even though you may be young, is simply by inviting, let's go to church. Let's go to church and you can learn about Jesus. It's a place where you can know His grace. Come with me. As simple as that. We ought to be doing this work. Lord, give me the heart. Give me the heart to want to save souls. Send souls in my way. I'm ready to share this good news. Send me souls. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Discourage us, Father, that they will receive our words. Thank you for your kindness. Thank, Thank you for, for your, your mercy. mercy. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the price you pay. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for unending grace. Thank you for your hope. Thank you for the life you Oh
Please bless my brother, my sister, my new friend. To be considered by the Lord of grace, to be shown his grace. Let him come to know himself and confess what he truly is. So he too truly can be moved by this grace. To now pay back with all that he has to the one who has laid down his life for them. Send us help. We want to live the rest of our lives one day at a time called this day to pay back for what you have done for us so in that day we can dwell in the place with you, our Lord.